Rajiv for having me in this course over the past many years now. And uh, after anti VEGFs, lasers, now I'll be talking of the role of steroids and vitrectomy in diabetic macular edema. So, as we all know, it's a chronic multifactorial condition, DMA, causes visual imp impairment that critically impairs the quality of life in the working population. anti vegf agents traditionally and still are the first line of therapeutic agents for the management of DMA. But we know uh, and the literature also supports that 30, around 40% of DMA patients uh, show more than three lines of visual impairment, only 40%. With the anti VEGF, suggesting the role of other factors besides VEGF in the causation and the pathogenesis of, of diabetic macular edema. So it's a crowded slide, but the, the take home message here in this slide is besides VEGF, there are other factors which have now been uh, you know proven, like uh, ICAM, VCAM, selectins, MCPs, and interleukin 6, 12, and TNF, which are responsible uh, besides VEGF for DMA. So, uh, long-term responses to anti-visual therapy. So, among eyes that showed limited initial visual improvement, limited that is less than five letters, only 20 to 30 percent might increase in visual equity over the long-term anti-visual therapy, following around you know three-year follow-up period or four-year follow-up period. So, what is the current perspective on the role of inflammation in DME? I will not go very detailed into into the trials. But there are increased levels, vitreous levels of VEGF, ICAM, IL-6 and MCP higher in DME patients than non-diabetic patients. So the conclusion here is that the study showed that the vitreous levels of these pro-inflammatory cytokines had an influence on retinovascular permeability and the severity of DME, not just VEGF but other cytokines also. So is dexamethasone or steroid effective in inhibiting inflammatory cytokines in DME? The next question is that. So again, uh, there's the first evidence from the clinical trials uh, setting. It says that the DEX implant, whether it is in the trials, 0.7 mg was also used and 0.35 mg was also used. And both were better than sham in uh, reducing the central subfield thickness. The second evidence is that when you switched from anti-VEGF to DEXA implant early, before uh, 12 months, the, the vision improvement was much more. And even if you switch in the second year, the vision improvement is more than the anti vision but it is not more when you switch in the first year. So early switching is always beneficial in refractory edemas. So the question is, how many of us choose steroid implants early in DMA care? We are always talking of anti vegfs Why not uh, dexamethasone implants or steroids? Because firstly, we are ourselves unaware of the suboptimal effect of anti vegf in our everyday clinical practice. We, do not, we have so many anti vegfs every day, we do not compare the effect at the fall of the patients. We say that the CST is decreasing but the vision is not improving, it's okay, we will continue with anti vegfs Or are we concerned with the side effects of steroids, whether it is IOP rise or whether, or whether it is cataract genesis. So now, you know, definite guidelines, especially, uh, specifically from Europe, have come out. So where does DEX implant fit into these guidelines? They have preferred, uh, dexamethasone implant is preferred among corticosteroids. It can be used as a first line in pseudo ficic eyes. It can be used as a first line in patients in ficic eyes with previous CV events. Can be used first line in patients unwilling to attend monthly injections or monitoring in the first six months. Compliance problems. It is the preferred first line therapy in eyes with serious retinal detachments and uh, DME OCD biomarkers like hyperreflective foci, many heart exudates, chronic DME, or neurosensory detachments. So the bottom line here is persisting to single treatment modality like anti vegf when it is not responding is not guaranteed to success. On contrary, it delays the effective treatment resulting in the final visual outcomes. Steroids for treatment naive patients, well that is controversial but now literature supports that pseudo ficic or ficic eyes that are not young, clear or crystalline can be given first line treatment, poor treatment adherence or compliance <coughs> or DME with suspicion of a high inflammatory component like hyperreflective dots with uh, uh, neurosensory detachments and not suitable for anti vegf therapy because of some systemic condition. So the key takeaways of steroids in DME is, of course, the first line of treatment still is anti vegf agents. And many patients uh, who fail to show uh, the, the usual response to anti vegf even with intensive treatment, you should look for an inflammatory pathology. And intravital corticosteroids block that production of VEGF and other inflammatory cytokines. And dexamethasone implant shows efficacy in the treatment of DME along with the favorable safety profile.
Coming uh, to the last topic that is vitrectomy for diabetic macular edema. So again, there are you know two schools of thought that it works, it does not work. So let's categorize it. First is the tractional DME. Of course, there is a definite role of vitrectomy because in tractional diabetic macular edema, the uh, the tangential traction and the anterior posterior traction is causing that macular edema. It's a physical thing. So uh, it includes uh, vitreal macular traction. It includes taut posterior hyaluronic membrane, epirectal membranes. And no amount of anti VEGF or steroids will help in these cases. You have to remove the physical force which is causing the traction. Second is a relative uh, indication that is recalcitrant macular edema. By definition, if you have given four or five intravital anti VEGF, switched on to alternative therapy like intravital steroids, and still the edema is persisting over a period of six months or more, that classifies into recalcitrant macular edema. And that is a relative indication for PPV. All the studies which I have done and our personal experience shows. There is excellent anatomical results with reduced reduction of central subfield thickness and uh, uh, restoration of a normal foveal contour uh, in all these uh, vitrectomies. So, uh, a couple of uh, short clips. So this is a patient of taut posterior hyaluronic membrane causing a persistent macular edema. Uh, the crux here is to stain it again and again because there are multiple layers before you reach the internal limiting membrane. So you stain with transplant acetonide. You can see a thick sheet which is the taut posterior hyaluronic membrane. You cannot take it out with a cutter, you have to peel it like ILM. Of course, it's different in consistency than uh, the ILM. It is more thick, it is more tenacious, but you gently you remove it. Then comes the uh, epirectal membrane beneath it. You stain it with trepan blue, then you peel it in the routine fashion. And finally, you stain it with brilliant blue, and then you catch hold of the ILM. So there are three layers which are uh, stained with three different dyes. And this is the final layer of the ILM which uh, I'm peeling here and it gives satisfactory results in terms of OCT contour of the fovea. The visual outcome depends on how long the TPHM has been there, uh, how long the traction has been causing that edema. There are uh, two short clips, two different uh, case scenarios of recalcitrant edema, macular edema. So <clears throat> this was a patient who had underwent multiple injections of anti vegfs The edema was still there and it's a laser PDR and a routine island peeling has been done and the patient did fine. He required uh, multiple injections after that, but they came down to two to three uh, per year and caused reduction in CMT. This one had a lot of cystoid spaces and the roof was very thin. So I, I was afraid that I would de-roof and cause a macular hole. So I did an inverted island peeling here and you know, trimmed the stumps so that not to de-roof the, uh, the, the fovea and cause a macular hole. The patient did fine in the post-op period. So to conclude indications, of uh, PPV and DME or PDR keep on evolving with time and the extent also. Any diabetic vitrectomy, whether it is for vitreous hemorrhage or for DME, is not a straightforward procedure and complications can happen. And data is inclusive, inconclusive for PPV and treatment knee wise. And despite, I, all, I have mentioned it twice also, uh, the central subfoveal thickness does reduce, the foveal counter does get in shape, but despite the best anatomical post operative outcome, vision gain is modest in many cases. Thank you so much.